All right, folks, Jack here. Um, isn't that pretty? I'm not talking about that cool copper color. I'm talking about that smoke. See that smoke just gently wafting out of there? It might be hard on the iPhone uh, to see it, but I'll tell you, it's just a gentle wafting smoke. Out of the Weber One Touch Grill, I want you to look at this uh, thermometer there. That's almost dead pegged on 250 degrees, which is just an ideal low and slow smoking temperature. And uh, I can do this with a Weber grill, a little kettle grill like this. These sell for, this is a Weber, Weber uh, One Touch Gold, so it sells for about a, oh, a whopping 150 bucks brand new on Amazon any day of the week. And they even come in cool colors now like this copper, and they come in green, and there's a limited edition crimson. I don't know why you'd want that. Normal black and like a forest green. Um, but these are one of my favorite grills, and like I said, I can do this, but it usually takes a lot of work. I'm playing with something that I've never used before. Uh, my jury's still out on it, but it's starting to look pretty good right now, and it's actually why I went ahead and got another kettle grill. It's called the Smokinator, and uh, it almost sounds like a scam, but it, it's not. And you can see right now, I've got three full racks of ribs cut in half. I'll talk about how I do this in a minute. There's the smokinator there. And you can see the water's boiling a bit. And that's creating steam. And that's keeping a nice moist environment. I just want to show you how that works. And I'll talk about it here in a second. But uh, there's the smokinator there. And there's plenty of videos on this thing. And I kind of thought it was a scam and bought it in spite of that. To see. And I'll tell you how it works. But there's 48 bricks of charcoal put in there. Unlit. About four or five pieces of wood chips or wood chunks. In this case, I'm using mesquite just to be different rather than using hickory like I usually do. And then you uh, you get 12 coals to white ash and you drop them in there. And that defied everything that I knew about barbecuing and having something work like this. And I just didn't think it would work. But, well, as you can see, it's looking pretty good. I'm using what's called a hover grill there to uh, keep, to be able to go ahead and do three full racks of ribs. I'm going to put that back over. I've lost my temperature, but I did want to show you mid-cook. You can see we've come down quite a bit. But let me tell you about this product and uh, how it works. What you do is, you, you like I said, you get uh, 12 coals going white ashed over, 48 coals inside the uh, Smokinator. You can look up other videos on it if you just want to see how to start it up. And uh, then you get it going. And uh, you put your, your lit coals in there, and you put your water in there, and uh, you run your vents on the bottom wide open, and they tell you to run your vents on the top halfway open. And I played around with it. It hasn't seemed to matter. You can see it climbing straight back up. And it might go a little over 250 degrees because I just gave it a big old shot of air. And I'll let you know if it... Uh, settles itself down right now it's reading about 255 degrees which i wouldn't complain about by a long shot let me tell you i did the ribs the ribs are done to rub with that apple cider vinegar and then listeners to the survival podcast will be familiar with this low and slow competition barbecue now you look that's empty and uh today i went in the pantry and i thought there were four or five of these things in the pantry and when I pulled them out, they were all Montana steak seasoning from Keith Snow instead of low and slow. And I was like, oh my God, no, I got to make ribs today. I need this. Well, good preppers. You can see that one's got some in it. I'll show you what's inside of here in a second. But uh, good preppers make sure they have reserves. I have about 10 of these up in the pantry upstairs. And uh, this is good stuff. Keith won't tell you what's in it. Um, give me a second. I'll open under it up. the uh, porch where the lighting's a little better. You can see it's pretty seedy stuff. There's some rosemary in there and some other things. I don't want to give away what he's doing. There's coriander, though. There's some, uh, there's definitely some black peppers, some mustard seeds going on in there. You buy this, you can figure out what's in it. But you'll love it so much, you'll just keep buying it. It smells wonderful. Keith would probably kill me if he knew. But I always actually add something uh, when, I, when I use this for ribs anyway and pork. I always add a little bit of brown sugar. Let's see where our temperature is. You can see because I gave all that air to it, it's hitting three, by almost about 275. I wanted to get down here and show you all this anyway. Right about there, I've choked off the flames underneath. And if you move that lever right there back and forth with this one touch, what it does is it actually drops all the ash that's in the lower part of the grill 
down into this ash pan for easy removal. To me, that's worth the uh, price of the upgrade alone. I'm going to leave that choked off a bit and bring that temp down. Coming back up here, though, when you read the Smokinator instructions, they tell you if you don't have a kettle grill that has built-in thermometer, to get yourself a thermometer and stick it in this hole right here. I think that's dumb. I think that's uh, just ridiculous. I'd say either spend the extra 50 bucks for the uh, One Touch Gold uh, because of the other features it has plus that. Or if you don't, if you already have like a regular One Touch or a Silver, uh, One Touch Silver or, one, uh, or just a uh, One Touch, and it doesn't have a built-in thermometer, go to Weber's website, buy this thermometer, drill a dadgone hole, and pop it in there. It takes a couple seconds to do. And I'd say it's definitely worth doing. Better than trying to cram a thermometer in that hole. Anyway, I'll be back later and let you know how this works out. Um, again, my deal with the Smokinator, I'm not, uh, I'm not pimping it for them. Um, this is the first time I've ever used it, which is why I didn't show the setup, because I want to figure out how it worked before I, I did that. And uh, I don't know if, uh, if I'm going to like it in the end, but so far it looks really good. And I'll come back and I'm going to show you what I do with ribs. And some people will say, that's the right way to do it. And some people will say, that's horrible. Or some people will say, you almost got it right. I'll tell you how I feel about food. If it tastes good, I'm happy with it. And I promise you, there ain't none of the people that will complain about this later on that would ever refuse to eat it. Anyway, man. It does not look like dinner, at least not right now. And uh, I just figured I'd throw some other stuff in this video for you. These are some of the ducks that, uh, I know it looks like a big duck, that's not a duck, it's a goose. Anyway, but four of them there are the ducks that we uh, started raising earlier this year. And as you can see from the earlier video, they've progressed quite a bit. There's three Rowans and a Khaki Campbell there. That's not a Rowan uh, uh, hen. Those uh, Rowans actually think that one right there, dead center looking toward the camera, is probably a hen. That's probably a drake, and that one over there is probably a drake, but we're not sure yet. We know that gal right there is a, uh, a khaki camel hen. And that is Buddy the, the Goose. Now, why would we name him Buddy? Well, one day we were out here, and Dorothy was talking to him, and she was going, Hey, Buddy, how are you? And, uh, you know, just like you call anybody Buddy. And uh, when she did that, I realized, well, he's grown up with these ducks, and he's a giant that thinks he's a duck, just like Buddy the Elf from the movie Elf. That, uh, that thought he was an elf when he was actually a human. So uh, there's Buddy the Goose, and hopefully he'll integrate back to his uh, goose flock later. We took him from his mama uh, when we tried incubating eggs, and we only got one egg to hatch. She got four eggs to hatch later on when she finally went broody, and we'll show you the results of that here in a minute. But I just want you to see, these are, uh, these are ducks. Uh, or, again, there's Buddy the Goose, but these ducks, these guys are about eight weeks old. And I'm about to show you what they looked like seven and a half weeks ago. These aren't those guys from uh, seven and a half weeks ago, but these guys are about half week old ducklings. These were shipped to us by EFAL, and they're in one of my little chicken tractors. And uh, even though they're a bit young, we've determined with ducklings, you're better off putting them out on the grass pretty quick because they make such a dadgone mess in their uh, brooder. With so much water, they spend so much time soaking wet that we lost a lot from our first batch just from them being too cold. And by being out here, all that water drains away into the ground. You can see there's their water right there. They managed to get funk up inside of this uh, stainless steel water. But uh, there's not much cuter than a duckling. There really isn't. I mean, baby chicks are cute, but a baby duckling is just adorable. That's a little Swedish. We got 22 assorted. And we think we got mostly Cayugas. Let me let him go back to his buddies. There's one American buff goo, uh, duck right there. There's definitely some Swedish, and there's some uh, khaki Campbells. There's, uh, and there's a few Rowans in there. The Rowans are like a giant mallard. But this is what those other guys looked like, well, not very long ago. And you can see how fast they grow. So we're definitely exp expanding the uh, homestead flock here. Let me see if I can find the uh, big geese and uh, their goslings and uh, give you an update on them, and then we'll go back to the grill. Get back to the grill. Let's check this out. These are eight young chickens. These were all successfully hatched from our incubator. I hatched 11. Three disappeared. We're pretty sure now it was a rat snake. Um, I just recently killed a rat snake here that they got into one of our brooders in our garage. And that doesn't make me proud. I don't like to kill snakes. But if you kill my livestock, you've got to go. And uh, see those white ones? 
the brown ones are just uh, Rhode Island reds, basically. But the white ones are kind of special. You see that white chicken right there? That's the mother of those chickens. I know that she's the only one I own. And the rooster behind her that we affectionately call Upgrade. And those of you who know the movie Idiocracy know the uh, the, ge the, the genesis of the term uh, of that name, Upgrade, with with with, a with two D's because it's a double dose. Uh, anyway, that chicken, that white chicken, is known as the Tetra Tent. She is uh, bred by crossing a white leghorn with a Rhode Island red, which Upgrade is. And we backbred her to Upgrade. So these little guys right here are 66% Rhode Island red, but white. Now, why did I do that? Because that is the greatest chicken I've ever owned or known of right there. I love that chicken. She's kind of mean. She's flighty. She's aggressive. But you see how little she is compared to that rooster or even that uh, gold sex link right there? She's tiny. She eats almost nothing. She's fast as lightning. And she lays a big, giant egg a day. Her eggs are so big, I feel bad for her when I look at those eggs and think that she had to lay that thing. And I wanted to see what happened if we uh, put a little more Rhode Island red genetics in there. And you can see they're getting a little bit of black spotting on some of them. We think that's a cockerel, and that one right there is a hen. So he's probably not going to see fall. A uh, little rooster there. But uh, the hens, will let you know how that goes. Now let's get back to the grill. I just want to show you something real quick that I'm pretty impressed with. You see that? 250 degrees. This cook's been going now for about an hour. Uh, it's probably been 25 minutes since you saw it come up on me when I uh, when I removed the dome cover. We're going to let this go about 30 more minutes and then I'll, I'll show you what I do to take the cooking uh, to the next phase with ribs. But uh, I've got the, uh, the vents open now, back open. I've got this half open like it says. I followed the directions, which apparently with the Smokinator do actually pay off. And uh, I'm holding a 250 degree low and slow cook. And I'm still getting a decent amount of smoke out of there. So uh, anyway, I'll be back with you and let you know how the uh, next phase goes. And I'll show you what I do. Now we're about to whip out the aluminum foil. Right, just real quick before I went too far, I wanted to go ahead and show you where we're at right now. This is only about five minutes after the last segment. You can see these ribs are just... They're just looking gorgeous, and you can see that beautiful seasoning cooking into them. Glaze from the sugar, and paprika coming on. Stuff down lower. It's probably cooking a little bit faster. You can see that, that liquid coming out of it right there, but nowhere near too fast. And then I realized, I said, you know, five or six or seven pieces of wood. I never really said how big they are. They're pieces about like that. I figure I'd add a couple pieces right now. And as you can see, even with the hover grill, I've just pulled it back a little bit. Um, and I have to, have to push it forward so I can close the grill. But I'm able to lift up this great feature on the Weber. And I can add some charcoal if I needed to. I really don't need to, but I just thought I'd show you that right there. So I popped that little piece of wood down in there. Give the coals a little bit of a stir. I just added some water. It was boiling pretty good, so that killed the boil. And again, we'll run this for about another 30 minutes. It'll have plenty of smoke flavor into it. And we gotta drop in one more chunk of mesquite here. And that's a pretty big chunk. Let's see if we can if we can get that in there. We can get anything in there. I don't know if we can get that one in there. Well, maybe. Put my little skewer here. They say it's a little one dollar skewer with the hover with the uh, smokeinator. That's in there. That should give us a little more smoke. We'll shut that down. Drag the hover grill a little bit forward. Pull that meat a little bit forward. Back on she goes. We'll give it about 30 more minutes under the smoke. And we'll go to uh, foil wrap, which is a big part of why I cut those rib racks in half. Just makes them easier to deal with. What is that sound? Just a quick shout out to Stephen Harris here. Those of you who know Stephen Harris know what that sound is. Those who don't, check out imakemygas.com. And back to the grill. So, um, seriously, back at the grill. This is impressive to me. 250 degrees is promised. Other than those couple little pieces of wood chips that I added, um, I pretty much added nothing since I started. And I probably would have opened the grill less if, uh, if I wasn't doing this video for you guys. Bottom vents are fully open, top vents are half open, and when I put my hand here, let me tell you, this is a moist smoke. I can feel 
the steam from the uh, from the the, uh, the water pot just accumulating on my hands right there. Now this is a beautiful basting smoke. It's now been about two hours since the ribs went on. Let's take a look at them. And uh, nice feature with the Weber cattle. It's got a little hook so you can do what I just did there. These ribs look beautiful. And as you can see, the fat is starting to... That tastes good. Just cook out of them. You know, the thing is, they're... I can touch this and tell you, this is not the tender fall off the bone rib you're looking for. But if you keep cooking this like this, even at this low temperature, um, unlike a brisket or a big old pork shoulder, these will dry out on you. So what I'm going to do now, and you don't need to see this, I'm going to wrap all six of these pieces. Again, this is three whole uh, racks. I'm going to wrap these tightly in foil, and I'll put them back on the grill. And when we do that, I won't need the hover row because I can stack them toward the rear because they'll all be wrapped. And I'm just basting them in their own juices, basically. And we'll take a look down inside the smokinator and see where we're at with it on a time thing. I have added water once to the water pan. You can see the way it's boiling. It really needs it again. Anyway, we'll be back in just a moment. Just real quick before I get them back on the grill, you can see I cut a little bit here. And it's, it's nicely ringed with a pink smoke ring, so you know you've got a good smoke. Um, they're still very juicy. You can see if I, if I push, you can see the juice is still in there. But with ribs, as you're cooking ribs, when they're really cooked well and they're going to be nice fall off the bone ribs, you'll see the bones start to protrude at the edge of the rack. And you can see that right now, none of that's happened you haven't seen the meat pull back hardly at all on the bone so these are actually cooked you could eat this there'd be no problem eating this except and even though I did eat that piece I cut off there to show you that smoke ring they're not super tender you can see that if I pull here it it resists a little bit now there's nothing wrong with it I can tell you there's plenty of juice left in there but if I cook that till it's tender on that grill uncovered, it will absolutely dry out. This is one of the kind of secret things that competition rib cooks do. Now, there's a couple different ways we could do this. One, we could put it back on for about an hour, and then we could wrap these foil packs in a towel and stick them into a cooler and leave them there for a couple hours to really tenderize them. But that's not really necessary. That's, that's kind of gilding the lily a little bit. What we'll do here is we'll put these back on for about an hour and a half, two hours, wrapped in foil, and we'll try to maintain that 250-degree mark, and then we'll be back with you. Okay, so I've got the uh, rib packs on the grill. Got a nice simmer going. Water pot still going. And they say uh, in the instructions that water pot is important not just for moisture inside the kettle, but it helps keep the overall temperature moderated, which I can definitely believe. I don't know how well this is going to work. I got a little flashlight action going here for you. You can see there's quite a bit of coals left in there. I poked around with one of the skewers. And I'd say there's plenty left in there for an hour and a half, two hours. So we're going to go back to uh, to running this thing with the kettle top on. Again, bottom vents open um, and top vents on a half open. I'm sure, I'm absolutely sure that temperature will come up now that I've been given another big influx of oxygen. But I'll let you know because what I'm expecting now is to be real close real fast after it spikes up a bit to that 250 uh, degree range which is just perfect and I have to say this it's never gone over 300 it spiked up 290 295 280 in that range when I've opened it up it's never gone above 300 and it's never had any trouble getting itself back up to that 250 degree range which took about 15 minutes the first time uh, after I dropped the hot coals in there so Right now, Smokinator's looking good, and let me tell you something, I'll confess, I cut one of those ribs off of that rack and I ate it, and it was damn good. If I brought you here right now, and you ate those ribs the way they are right now, you might say they could be a little bit more tender, but you would not say there's anything wrong with them. They have a perfect smoke flavor, they have a perfect seasoned flavor, all they need now is to be tenderized. I'm thinking, uh, no need for two hours, probably one hour in there in that foil, and we'll be done. And I'll take a look at them then. I'll tell you right now, if everything keeps going the way it is, I vastly prefer this for smoking a couple, three racks of ribs or a single brisket or one pork shoulder or one chicken or turkey 
to my side box smoker. If I got 15 people coming over, it's coming out. Um, but the efficiency of what I'm seeing here and the reliability, and look at that temperature, just while I'm talking since I put it back on. I mean, we're right at 250 again. I know it'll run up a little bit because it has before, but I also know if I come back in 20 minutes, I, I'm pretty much sure where it's going to be. Again, I've added no fuel except those couple pieces of wood, and I really only did that just to show you how you could add wood. Everything's looking good. I'm thinking for a three to four hour cook, the instructions are perfect, and you may have to add material after that for a longer cook. Um, Smokinator, I'm becoming a fan. I've always been a fan of the Weber kettles. This is just another reason to be a bigger fan. Anyway, I'll be back later and show you the results we have. All right, guys, there's the uh, finished product. You can see what I was talking about earlier. When you've got ribs done right, that meat starts to pull back off that bone. Now this was just at about a four hour cook and as you can see it is quite tender. Let's uh, compare this to earlier. Look at, look at that. You have to trust me that it's good. Let's go ahead and cut through one here. It's hard to do with one hand. Look at that. Now that is absolutely beautiful. There are people that would put that back on the grill for 20, 25 minutes to firm it up, but um, today especially, I'm just not one of them. I think that's about as beautiful as a rib can be. Chef Keith Snow, low and slow barbecue. A little bit of brown sugar added on the smokinator. I'm a fan of stuff in the back of Mandouli sausage. So the last time I uh, videoed it now, I got hungry and didn't want to wait for the ribs, so I popped some of that on and uh, used the residual heat to cook it. And guys, it was 250 degrees when I pulled it off. I did throw 10 more coals in there. I don't know if I really needed to or not, but four hour cook, steady 250 degrees from the time we hit it, uh, other than some spikes from some uh, extra uh, air when we were opening it up. I probably would have opened it up a lot less if I wasn't shooting this video. And again, just look at that. There's nothing dry about that, and there's nothing tough about that. That is just about as perfect as a rib can be. All right, guys, check out the Smokinator. Check out the Weber Kettle Grill. Check out uh, Chef Keith Snow, and hey, even check out uh, IMakeMyGas.com for that little shout-out there in the middle.